Here we go, folks. It's another one of those philosophical videos. A lot of talking. Uh, if you enjoy what I do, maybe you can like, maybe you can subscribe. It would help a lot if you did that. If you posted a comment. Um, actually, I'm very open to discussion. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this topic. And it's related to what I talked about last week about connecting your ears to your guitar. Last week's video was a promo video for the book that just came out. Uh, you should get it because it's still related to that. It's about learning how to learn quickly and efficiently the same way a lot of the very best players in the world learn. Why are they able to learn so quickly? And it's, it's something that I talk about in that book. And that book itself is actually a philosophical one. But if you can sort of adopt some of the strategies, I'm very, very convinced that you can increase your learning efficiency. I know so because I'm once one of those people and I've taught this, it's not a method, but this lifestyle to other people who have been able to incorporate with some, with a certain degree of success. And that's this certain degree of success where I'm going to talk about this because a lot of this also depends. Uh oh, here it is. I'm going to say it talent. I talked about talent last week and I want to talk about it today. It's a little bit of a controversial topic, a sensitive one that people can get some people riled up. But I think it's worth talking about and kind of in a logical way. The goal of this video is not to say, ah, you don't have talent. This person does not at all. It's actually a motivational video to tell you that no matter what, with enough work and with a discipline, passion, you can reach a certain degree of success. I remember some years ago, I kind of got into this discussion. I stayed very calm, but the other person just got so riled up and pissed off at me. So talent doesn't exist. It's only hard work. If, if that's true, like when you go to school, how can you justify that some people, no matter how hard they try and how hard they study, they struggle. And some people barely study, barely even try. They don't struggle. Their talent does exist, but it's not everything. And that's the point of this video. And last week, I talked about this book being about developing habits. And that is the hardest thing. I think it was my friend, uh, Andy Mack, who once told me that habits are extremely, are statistically very, very difficult to change. And this is, but this is the key. Um, if you could adopt the lifestyle that I'm describing in the, in the, in my book, that's probably the biggest obstacle, the biggest hurdle. But if you can somehow incorporate some of those strategies, I'm very, very convinced that you can improve your situation significantly. I said last week that over the years, over the, some of the training that I've done for myself, kind of actually by accident, naturally, as I explained last week, I'm able to learn faster, just as fast as any of the fastest players, uh, the best players. But then it begs the question, why am I not one of the best players in the world? Well, I've mentioned that in, in the past. Being able to learn fast means you're able to absorb information quickly and store it into your short-term memory. But then you still have to practice a lot to store things into your long-term memory to build um, what is called uh, muscle memory. And, you know, I've, I've mentioned this in previous recent videos that I'm just not interested in being like a supreme god of guitar or jazz guitar. It's not that I'm satisfied with my level or anything like that, but I've thought a lot about my life situation, you know, in recent years, especially during the pandemic. And really all I want to be in life is, is to be happy, to be in a good mental state. And I realized for myself that practicing 12 hours a day, especially, especially if it feels forced, it's not for me. Um, I still manage to progress. And I still practice from time to time, not a lot, but I prefer to live life kind of, um, not in a lazy way, but just follow my instinct and make sure that I feel content. So that's why I'm not a god of guitar. So let's talk about talent. Let's define this. 
I think talent, like many things, exists on a spectrum. In terms of music, talent, you can be talented for being able to figure out single notes. That's something that I actually had from early on. I was able to figure single notes out fairly quickly. But then there's also maybe talent for being able to hear harmony. And as I said last week, that was one of my biggest weaknesses. Something that I was so ashamed of that I couldn't hear what seemingly everyone around me was able to hear in terms of harmony. And that's something that I addressed, that I worked on, that I overcame. And now it's something that I'm pretty good at. There's talent for rhythm. There's talent for creativity. There's talent. There's all, it sits on a wide spectrum. And uh, one of the transcribers for DC Music School, my buddy Larry, I don't know if he watches my videos, sometimes he does. <laughs> he's, a, <laughs> he's a very, very, very big video game nerd. It's all he cares about besides music. And uh, he talks to me a lot about his games. And I realize there are a lot of uh, analogies that can be made between gaming and practicing jazz guitar or jazz music in general. So he talks about these games where... These, uh, what are you called? MMO, RPG, whatever they're called, the multiplayer, multiplayer games, whatever, where you build your character to a really high level. So your character is super powerful. And in these games, you have what is called like end game builds. So you have these skills that you can use that are specific, that are optimized for end game. End game meaning when you, once your character has reached a really, really high level, you use specific strategies, specific um, skills that are available to that character. Now, these same skills are also available to the character very, very early on, but they are considered super inefficient because in order to take care, to, to make use, to exploit those uh, skills to their maximum potential, you have to have a certain level. And instead, when you're starting out, you should focus on other skills which will help you bring your status up and then gradually you change and playing music is the same thing depending on your 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 ten levels for the different um, musical uh, factors rhythm harmony creativity etc a person who is naturally talented for let's say rhythm does not need to spend much time working on getting a better time feel and a person who is good at uh, hearing chords doesn't really have to spend as much effort on that area do you see what I mean and that's one of the biggest problems with jazz education in my opinion I'm generalizing of course but I, I do see this quite a lot again on the internet or even in music schools they, they have this curriculum it's like all right practice this practice that uh, practice your scales, practice your modes, practice your target notes, practice your drop two points, blah, 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 blah. All those things actually are good to practice depending on your situation. But they can be a big waste of time for those who are not ready to take advantage of those skills. So this is where I'm getting at in this, with this video. Let's use another analogy that, I've, that I came up with recently. Let's say you have a person like many people, it's like a thousand people. And let's say you have, it's like a game, you have 20 doors ahead of you. Only one of them is the correct one. Statistically, some people are gonna open the correct door. You have one in 20 chances of opening the correct door, right? And then that correct door is the correct door. They just got it by chance. There's no, it's just pure luck. And that, those are the people who are quote unquote talented. So you open that first door and you get the correct one. And then you have, you go through the door and then you have 30 doors. And then 40 doors, 50 doors. Now, statistically, if you have, let's say, a pool of a million people, maybe actually one person will open all the correct doors just by pure chance. That's like the supremely talented person. That's be really Legrand. <laughs> I've talked about this in the, the Gypsy, the Sinti community, how a lot of players, it's something that I'm very, that fascinates me greatly because most of these players 
learn through instinct. They don't receive the kind of instruction that the, the rest of us tend to receive. You go see a teacher and they'll tell you to work on this scale, this slick arpeggio. A lot of them, the education that they get is more is very very vague and very general you can actually see this in action in a documentary from a long time if you type maybe samson schmidt and dorado schmidt when samson was maybe like 10 years old or 8 years old whatever 12 years old you see dorado trying to teach samson because dorado himself is also self-taught in that way through instinct he can't tell him oh it's the ninth ferris it's more like no like this no sounds wrong don't speed up don't slow down it's a very vague way of uh, teaching and I've witnessed this myself in that community when I've spent time with them when I've seen like just in in the background watching kids being taught by the elders it's the same thing uh, it's very very fascinating and what fascinates me about this is okay so they rely purely on their self oh, their ability to observe to progress and so those who get really really good are able to get really really good because of their talent because they open a lot of the right doors that's how you end up with a hockey guys they talk to rosenberg burial grand i would say that burial grand is the guy who opened every single door practically all of them and then actually what you don't see is in a lot of uh, the the this community a lot of them don't get very very far and therefore you never hear about them and that's where a different kind of education with more specific guidance could be very 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 useful but i promise you one thing about this book again barring the 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 the, the, the hurdle of adopting the lifestyle is you can learn to open those doors as well with a lot of work unfortunately depending on your 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 talent level and how much you're willing to sacrifice for how much you're willing to pay the price for it i remember when i was in high school went to french school <laughs> there was this kid his name is emile <laughs> that guy is a genius and he, he he's i i heard he's a he's a very successful lawyer doesn't surprise me in my high school um you had emile who was reading dragon dragon ball z comics in uh, french literature class and the fr <laughs> I remember the French teacher getting so pissed off at him. Is she, uh, the she yelled at him and said, "Emil, you're either gonna go outside and read your comic book, or you're gonna stay here and listen to what I have to say." You know what he did? He actually just walked out and started and just read his Dragon Ball. And that guy always got really, really good grades. Not the best grades, but for someone who put so very little effort, he got really really good grades and then there was this other girl she was the genius she was the top i don't know what she's doing now her name was anais i remember she always got near perfect scores unbelievable and she i could she she studied her i could see that she was always studying and then there's this other guy uh another taiwanese guy in my class uh, born in taiwan though i was born in montreal but anyway liang he's another guy who studied super hard as well but he got the same grades as Emil, just maybe a little bit lower. So Liang put as much effort as Anais, and he got good grades. But Anais got the top scores. Emil didn't really do anything, and he was maybe second, third best in the class. Liang, very, very respectable, worked as hard as Anais, but never caught up to either of them. I think that's the talent factor. And what I'm trying to say here is, let's say you're lacking, let's say you're not good at being able to hear harmony in a natural way, the same way someone else is able to. You can work on it, but you're going to have to really, really work on it, spend a lot, a lot of time. It's something that I actually did to overcome that barrier. So the hours, the years, the months I spent training my ears to be able to hear a harmony at the same level as everyone else, well, talent people were able to skip that whole process altogether. That's why they get good really, really, really fast early on and they can progress even farther. Another thing that I was not good at, and I'm still not good today, but it, it was rhythm. 
um, I've shared this story with you before that rhythm guitar was one of my weaknesses. I had a good sound, but everyone kept complaining about my time feel. And I worked on this so obsessively that it's became, become one of my biggest strengths. Talk about Dragon Ball, right? Uh, maybe some of you older folks don't know this, but in Japan, everyone knows this. In Dragon Ball, Goku is considered the most powerful character in the entire universe. But actually, his son Gohan has a higher potential than Goku himself. But Gohan never surpassed his dad because at one point, he stopped practicing. So, talent is not enough. You still have to practice. And people with, let's say, less talent, it's not an on-off switch. You know, it's not that I was 0% rhythm. Maybe my rhythm skill was 50% instead of 100%. Well, anyway, I worked on rhythm, so much, rhythm guitar so much that I surpassed, in my opinion, quite a lot of people who were more naturally talented for it. So that s says something about, you know, your drive and your determination to, to overcome obstacles this other thing a rhythm that's still a problem that I have today I'm going to talk about right now and I know where it comes from it's com it comes from me being impatient let's say if I'm showing a, a phrase out of time let's say um, this I have a tendency to do something like this let's say I play it slow I just want to get it over with I'm just like all right here it is slow ah. See, I rushed tremendously That's because I wanted to get it over with. And that's a really, really terrible habit that I have, that I still have. I noticed it from last week's video. As I was eating the video, I was cringing. I was like, I showed this. Here, I think it's okay. But last week, I was just showing it. Kind of like sped up like that. It's such a really, really bad habit. And this habit has caused me to, to rush a lot when I'm soloing. But it's something that I, I'm i still working on, but I've, I'd say, fixed maybe 75. Let's say before it was like 40%. Now I think I'm at 75, 80%. If I really concentrate, if I really think hard, I, I can get my, my, my uh, I can control that. So it's, it's something that I worked so much on. Other people didn't have to work on it. Um, Rocky Gresset, Bire Lagrand, when he plays Gypsy Jazz and when he plays um, Bebop, his time feels change completely. And it's like adapted to the style because I guess when he was listening to his favorite players, he subconsciously absorbed the rhythm, the time feel of those players. And when I asked him about it, I was like, oh, really? Is that what I do? I don't even know. I just play how I feel. And he just feels things correctly, whereas me, I remember early on, I couldn't tell, like when people were talking about playing behind the beat, on the beat, ahead of the beat, I was like, again, feeling so ashamed because I couldn't hear anything like that. So I trained myself to be able to hear it. I spent years, hours, like listening, so kind of developing that, that ability to hear that nuance. Now I hear it super well. And that's how I noticed last week that I rushed when I did that. I didn't notice it when I was showing it because I was just, I wasn't really thinking when I was showing it. But yeah, uh, things like that. You, actually, this intro video that you saw me play, I can't even but love this improvisation I did. You know, I was obviously, I'm, I'm, I was very conscious that I was doing a performance. So I was telling myself, all right, play with a good time feel. And so I recorded that uh, solo and I checked out my time field. I was like, yeah, this is actually really good. Time. So it proves that you can work on it. Um, I worked on it really, really hard. It, I'm not going to lie. It did not come easy. It, I paid a big, big price to be able to, to correct this. And again, I wouldn't say that I've corrected it 100%. I'd say maybe 70 75%, which is good enough for most standards. But um, the question is, if you have certain weaknesses, what price are you willing to pay for it? Um, I can't answer that for you. And as I said earlier in the beginning of this video, I'm not actually interested in being a god of guitar. So I'm not willing to pay the price any more than I already have. Maybe in the future, I'll spend more time.
practicing addressing some of my weaknesses other weakness i have others i know all of my weaknesses i know all of my strengths i'm very very self-aware of my true ability and i have the knowledge to address every single one of those issues the question is am i going to do them for some yes some i prioritize some over others i worked a lot on the rhythm aspect of playing rhythm guitar because i wanted to play with a lot of my favorite players and by working on that that allowed me to play with a lot of my favorite players so this is a huge topic and i can also make a video about like how it can be dangerous to study with people who are very naturally talented this happens a lot in the violin world and i was just talking to a friend of mine yesterday I, um, my friend yumi she's a huge fan of uh of this violinist who is ex insanely talented this violinist has been playing jazz since they were like maybe eight years old or seven years old and they learn by instinct like the gypsies uh, they can play over like complicated songs giant steps blah 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 but they have no idea what they're doing they just feel it they just hear it and when this person teaches they say the same thing oh i don't try to think in terms of this like theory academic way and i i actually fully agree with them but when you tell that to someone who doesn't have that talent that you have to hear things naturally it's like oh just just feel the changes to giant steps just don't think about like the chords just feel it good luck it's the same thing with rhythm. There are some people who have insanely tight rhythm. It's like, ah, the metronome is useless. Just feel it. Someone who has bad rhythm, following that advice, good luck. <laughs> so when it comes to practicing, there is no one single ultimate practice routine. It is all situational. It depends on you, your psychological state, your level, everything. Um, so that's why I'm in disagreement with a lot of modern jazz education that tells you oh this is the curriculum you should do this actually on the there's nothing wrong with that curriculum itself what's wrong is that it does not take into account the level of the student and they might not be ready to tackle those things and i am of the belief that when you for example if you play a jazz guitar you need to have very very specific goals i made videos about this about knowing exactly what it is that you want to do so that you can have very clear goals and achieve them um most of us, if we play jazz guitar, gypsy jazz, bebop, whatever, chances are you want to play with other people. And if you want to play with other people, what's the logical thing to do? You got to learn songs, a few songs. And if you, let's say, very few, again, like, like I said, very few people have zero talent across all the board. Very, very few people. Some people are good at one, a few things, but not good. Anyway, let's say you struggle with soloing. What's cool about jazz guitar is that you don't have to solo in the beginning. You can just learn to play decent rhythm. And if you can play decent rhythm or accompaniment, maybe you can find very advanced players to play with regularly. That's something I'll talk about in another, maybe another video. Wow, a lot of videos I can talk about here. But uh, that's exactly what I did in the beginning. I didn't play solos. I was just playing rhythm guitar because I didn't know how to solo when i was learning gypsy jazz or django style whatever you want to call it i remember that i knew all the right scales right arpeggios to play and when i played everything i played was correct but it really didn't sound like the music that i was listening that i was listening to so that's why i was so hesitant about wanting to solo so i remember one day stefan remble came over to my place while he was on tour this is before he was famous <laughs> so we started jamming and luckily i could play kind of okay rhythm i sped up a lot those days but i was able to play rhythm to quite a number of songs so it was a lot of fun i was just jamming i was just accompanying him then at one point we we're playing minor swing and then it was pretty fast too probably because i sped up and stefan then goes all right your turn to solo and i was like no i don't want a solo but he forced me to but that's that's just another story okay so i didn't have a natural talent for soloing so okay i played rhythm a lot in the beginning and that helped me a lot to learn how to hear chords properly but then for the soloing stuff, I started transcribing. Uh, maybe not transcribing, like writing down the solo, but I started figuring out lines to play over 
the various chord progressions, lines that were that sounded in the style. And I remember one of the first solos that brought that helped me put me in the right direction was Django's uh, 19 first recording of minor blues. All these phrases that he would play over a minor chord, I adapted them to all the various minor chords, G minor, C minor. Then I would use them in other songs like minor swing, A minor. So yeah, talent exists, but hard work is also super important. There are some people that I know, that I've known for a very long time, over 10 years, who are more talented than me. And I tried to show them certain things early on when we first met, but they never worked on it for whatever reason. Because, again, there are different factors, you know. Maybe sometimes it's pride, overconfidence, or kind of delusion that kind of like a false delusion like mm, how do you say you know you have to work on it but you don't because like as my friend Andy Max said if it was him habits are statistically extremely hard to change but I know these people to be more talented because I can see them how they can absorb things so quickly but they don't put the effort to work for it to overcome their weaknesses and so they're ta more talented than me but after more than 10 years, them still being at the same level, I know for a fact they will never, ever catch up to me, statistically speaking. It would take a very big miracle, some kind of shock or epiphany for them to realize, all right, I better address all those issues that Dennis talked about 10 years ago. So hard work matters a lot. So this other thing about talent or progression, you know, we don't all have to be like B. Ray Legren. And here's the funny thing is when I first worked with uh, Sylvain Luc, probably in one of those freak aliens out there like B. Ray Legren, he said something to me that made me really, really happy, but it was also very funny. He said, hey, Dennis, I checked out your YouTube channel. You're a really good musician. You can play. And I was like, oh, I'm very, very flattered, but uh, compared to guys like you and B. Ray Legren, I'm a nobody. And he said, well, you know, B Birelli and I, we're on another level. We are extraordinary. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but, and he's not wrong. He, those guys are like freaks of nature. The people who open all the right doors, like one person, once in a lifetime kind of people. But a person like me, I'm the average musician who worked really hard, who achieved well, who was able to get that kind of compliment from Sylvain Luc. I worked, I, sat, I paid a price, and I can still continue to pay a price to get better, but I'm not really willing to do it. Are you willing to do it? So the point I want to make is, I want to use like uh, weightlifting as an analogy, because it's something that I actually do. I haven't done it in a while because I've been traveling around. I do it for health reasons. In the past, um, at one point I did it just to see how far I could push myself. And like I ate, all the right things, you know, follow all the right diets. At my best, I was able to bench press two plates in quite a number of reps. I don't remember how many. Uh, and that's a number of reps of two plates, bench pressing that, that's pretty impressive. But there are people like football players who can bench press like, I don't know, 300 pounds, 400 pounds with very little, with the same effort that it took me to do those two plates. But here's the thing, it's the same thing with music. How beneficial is it to your day-to-day -day life to be able to go to that extreme? Let's say in terms of technique, let's say some people are able to play 16th notes with no problem, like for like five minutes straight at 200 BPM. How often does that come? Up, like being able to play 16th notes non-stop for five minutes straight almost never right already being able to maintain 16th minute 16th notes for maybe 100 at 150 bm for five minutes straight is already very 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 impressive and it's a more realistic goal for for most of us and so the point i want to make with this last statement is not about being a god it's about being a competent musician and to be a competent musician, the bar isn't actually that high. Um, being able to play relatively in time, uh, being a good, a decent, having a good, decent sense of awareness, 
relatively decent technique, relatively decent um, ears, it's achievable for most of us. If you're able to adopt the right mindset and work on tackling each of these weaknesses. And let's, let's go to the extreme. Let's say you're, for some reason, talentless across all boards, rhythm, everything. Well, you have to ask yourself, do you need to be a decent soloist? Let's, if you're talentless across all boards, which most people are not, you can still work on addressing certain things and bringing, up, bringing those things to a decent standard. Uh, you can just focus on playing, being a rhythm player and bring that to a decent... I know people like that who I help them bring their rhythm guitar level to such a level that they can be working with famous players, professional level. And their soloing level is not so great or it's just decent. They, they still make practice, they, they still progress, but it's something they do in their own time and as a hobby. So think about that. If you, as a guitarist, gypsy jazz guitarist or whatever, if you can just be a decent accompanist, that opens a lot of doors. And it's something that I realized early on for myself. Why It's one of the reasons why I focus so much on playing rhythm guitar, so I could have access to all these high-level players. And having access to these players helped me get better at the other things that are less important for myself anyway. I mean, namely solo and all that stuff. So there we go. Food for thought. Check out my book. If you're interested, if what I said kind of uh, touches you somehow, convinced you somehow, motivates you. There we go. See you next time.